good for me to write this talk. <laughs> um, the, the Scala Macros project began when I was still at EPFL as a postdoc, um, now at a Scala tech lead here at TypeSafe. Um, and I guess I've been kind of living in denial about macros. Um, from a compiler writer's perspective, they're really scary because you get to really poke around in the compiler. I never really thought about that in the last 10 years that my people might end up doing that. Um, for those of you who've written a macro before, um, care to raise your hand? Maybe you could start like a club later. All right, not too many people. So okay, great. There won't be too much repetition going on then. Anyway, um, oh, and there goes the microphone. Is it still on? No? Okay. <laughs> That's weird. Okay, well, so without further ado, Scala macros. Um, so as I implied, macros are still experimental. They're experimental for a good reason. Um, I think you can do really cool things with them, and I definitely saw a lot of those examples while preparing this talk and reading bug reports during the year. Um, so yeah, I, I just right, really want to recommend to avoid them. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions about that? <laughs> Which part of experimental wasn't clear? No, OK, well, anyway, I think there's a lot of really cool things to be said about macros, but let's start with the beginning. It's just a method. It's a method run by the type checker, right? So you're writing something that's running in the compiler's domain. Um, I first want to give credit where credit is due. Eugene has done an amazing job at building a macro community, writing documentation, turning something that wasn't meant to be uh, programmed uh, into something that is now being programmed by a lot of people, actually, if you look around for macros out there. And, and Dennis, who, who made actually pattern matching and creating uh, Scala ASTs, uh, something that is, doesn't make you want to pull your hair out. So the source, is, there will be a lot of links in this talk. Um, they're all, so this talk is available on GitHub. Um, come see me later if you can't read the URLs. Um, I won't be clicking those links during the talk, except if you ask me. So that being said, feel free to interrupt. I'll um, be happy to take any questions or heckling or whatever. Uh, during the talk. So macros, I said, are a method. They're really two. Um, there's a macro definition, which is what you see as the user using the macro, calling the macro. It just looks like a normal method, except that there's something funny about its uh, body. It has this red keyword, uh, depending on your editor, um, that says it's a macro. And it says what the implementation is for this macro. When a call is seen to this foo thingy, um, what actually happens is the compiler runs the foo meta thingy, passes in the context that lets the macro call into the call back into the compiler, uh, both for analyzing what's around the macro and for emitting code. And the macro implementation will then emit code. So um, the first part here, this is this is you'll see this everywhere in your macros. You'll need you'll need that package. I'll, I'll talk some more about what the black box context is. For now, just think about it as your hook into the compiler. And this is the result of your macro, which is going to be a tree, representation of a Scala program. Um, this, the universe here is um, the compiler itself. And you're going to import all of it. And then we're using a quasi quote to generate a Scala program that consists of unit, the empty block. So. Um, if I just run this and my computer isn't having some kind of weird problem, the REPL will start up and it'll say, yep, I defined this foo meta thingy for you. And, oh, yeah, so as I told you, macros are experimental. Okay, they're experimental. <laughs> but we can fix that. I just left this in to prove that it's actually a REPL. So, there you go. So now I've defined a foo macro. All this meta talk, um, I don't like all this you know, stuff about, I mean, I, I, I spent my whole academic career doing type theory and all that, but you don't really need any of that to understand what's going on here. We're just writing a program that's analyzing or generating another program. That's it. OK, so let's look a little closer at this meta program. I already told you a lot about it so far. So. Um, it doesn't matter what this argument is called. Of course, you can call it context. Um, you do have to return trees that are dependent on this context. 
And as I said, the macro implementation will will give you an inter will give you a representation of the program that you want your macro to expand to. Everybody with me so far? This is kind of the boring part, I guess. Right. So this is a this is a dependent type. Um, context is the argument here, so it's a value. And in Scala, actually, all types depend on some value. It might just be a package, uh, or well, I really didn't. Sorry about that. Um, so in this case, it's it's the first method argument. Does that make sense? I think it'll become a little clearer during the talk. So what we're really doing is making sure that you're not mixing up. Um, it's not essential actually for it to understand the talk, um, but it's part of how the compiler is designed. It's the, it's the outer pointer to the cake essentially. Okay. Any other questions or remarks? No. Just yell if I don't see you. There's these huge pillars in front of me. So, um, so as I said already, when we import the universe, that's called global in the compiler implementation, which is what I'm a little bit more familiar with than the macro side of things. Um, and we're just importing all the types that are defined in there. So tree is an example, or a type, or a symbol. And this is a quasi-code. This is your best friend when you're a macro writer. This lets you construct Scala trees. Um, and since well, I'll talk a little bit more about them later. I don't want to tell you everything at once, because then you'll just go back and drink more beer. Um, all right. So now that we've defined this macro, obviously we want to invoke it and see what happens. So I have here our little friend Foo um, that we're calling in my typically named class C with method M. Um, and there we go, we defined that class. I'm going to make some room on the screen. And to really show you what's going on under the hood, I'll just run the Java P command. So this is running a REPL behind the scenes. Um, and it'll show you that the bytecode for the method M is just return, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Or would you like to experiment with different quasi quotes or foo meta? We can. Don't have to. Would you like to? Someone yell or something? Yes, yes. I heard yes. That's not a valid Scala expression, though. Would you like to do something more specific? So um, I prepared print line, but you know there are other things you can do. Print line is good. Print line is good. Always good. All right. So let's print something. Well, I could leave those curlies, but let's just. Um, so what do you want to print line? Hi. Hi. No, that's that's very creative. <laughs> So, oh, sorry, I keep forgetting there's this microphone in my face. I apologize. Um, so, oh, great. Quasi quotes, you know, as I said, macros are experimental. Um, we can't do high. Can we do low? No, we can do, we can do high, no problem. I'll do high. We'll show you interpolation. I'm pretty sure that works. <laughs> this is. To be, to, to be fair, this is because we're running into REPL and there's all kinds of weird stuff going on to make this run like interactively. And as soon as you do, as you all know, the demo effect, things break. I tested <laughs> print line one. I wasn't counting on someone wanting to print stream, to be honest. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Well, it's OK. Just buy me a beer later. So. All right, so now the compiler is happy. We have our implementation of our macro. I promise you this will work when you're doing it in a real program. The REPL isn't the greatest for this kind of stuff, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell Dennis that he needs to fix it uh, tonight. Um, he's in Europe, so he's almost awake again. Uh, it's not too bad. Um, OK, so where was my? There. So let's redefine our class. And now, of course, we want to see our um, extremely intelligent uh, optimizer inline that thing. So this is what you get when you call print line on high. You load the constant, you invoke, well, first of all, you get the, um, the outer pointer for the pre-def call. Um, you invoke the virtual, which is print line, and then, well, you have to get this unit thingy because that's the result of your method, so that's gonna be your boxed unit, as I'm sure you've all <laughs> come to love when you look at Java bytecode, emitted by Scala C. This is not running under the optimizer, by the way. Um, OK, so basically what this has shown you is that approximately macros are just you know, hand-rolled inliners, right? That's, that's what they are um, ideally. That's kind of the use case I am comfortable with. I find using 
that you guys are doing that kind of stuff. That's fine. So now we'll look at all the crazy stuff you can do. Okay, so um, I, t I promised I was going to uh, explain some more about what the black box context is. And I think of it as a benign context because I have to fix the bugs that are you know, behind the white box context, which is you know, just wild. So there's no need to look inside. Um, and what I mean by that is that someone is reading your code and there's a macro invocation, they know what's going on. It's just a method call. They don't need to understand the implementation of the macro. All they need to know about it is the signature of that method, of the foo method. They don't need to look any further than that. So the same holds for the IDE, same holds for any tooling that you've got uh, running on your code, incremental compilation, all that stuff. Black box macros are constrained so that they can't mess with the compiler modulo bugs um, so that this, this invariant is invalidated. So whenever you can write a black box macro, if you're already writing a macro, make it a black box, please. So the nice thing about this is that you can do code generation, which I've shown you, um, which is great for eliminating a lot of boilerplate. And you can emit better error messages because you're kind of writing a domain-specific language. You know what error messages should look like. It's not going to be some random overload that's not being found. So that's great, too. Feel free to emit error messages and warnings. I think that's a perfectly valid use of macros. Any questions so far? Yep. Is it, um, is it, is it possible to get the name of the method that you're being invoked in? Yep. It? It's called the prefix. Or you mean the enclosing method or the target of your ma or macro call? Both are available. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I mean, and, and that's, a, that's, that's basically, excuse me, my point of the night is that that's the real challenge in writing your macros, figuring out what the API for the compiler is and what all those methods do. I've been working on a compiler for six years now. Um, I'm still not entirely sure about all of them. Um, so... There's a lot in there, and we've done like we've done. Eugene has done an epic job of kind of carving out an API that exposes what you need to know. But even during writing this talk, not everything is there yet, and that's why we're calling it experimental. It's going to keep changing during 2.11 um, because we don't feel it's ready yet. Um, but yeah, we're we're definitely working on improving that part. You pass parameters into macro. Uh, you can pass type parameters. You can't pass anything else because of the meta level. Um, jump that you're making. So whatever your macro implementation is doing, it needs to know it at compile time. Yeah, constants are known at compile time. I'll, I'll have a bigger example for you later where we pass in a constant. Um, but that's about it. It needs to be tracked by the types. And constants are actually. We have types that say, this is an int one. Our types actually don't know what constant it is. They don't just say, oh, it's an int, and I don't care, like Java. I don't know if Java knows. They just don't tell you. Um, so here we get to our white box context. And this is where all the action is, really, to be honest with you. Um, um, I'm talking about bug fixing, obviously. Um, so and, and then there's a couple of things that invalidate pretty deep invariants that I, I consider pretty dear about understanding programs. So first and for all, you need to run the macro just to determine the type of the macro call. So that means IDEs that don't support macros, they're out. If you as a human don't support ex macro execution, you won't understand what's happening in the code because you don't know what the type is for the next call on that macro. So if you do foo.bar, you don't know if that's going to type check because you don't know what, what, what foo does in its, in its implementation. You don't know what the type is going to be. Whereas with a regular black box macro, you can look at the signature for foo and say, oh yeah, it returns a string. String doesn't have a method bar. Well, maybe there's an implicit in its code. But you know, that's about it. That's also why I don't like implicits that much. Um, so they can guide implicit search. There's an API to, set, to tell implicit search, hey, don't consider this one, do consider that one, what are the implicits in scope, and so on. So your macro can do all of that when it's a white box macro. And full type inference is delayed until after expansion, which allows really neat tricks, and I'll show you one. Um, but it, again, it also hinders uh, understanding of your program. And finally, you can use them as extractors. You can use them to kind of on the fly create extractors, which is really cool because um, what I did the year before joining TypeSafe was rewrite the pattern matcher, and it's really exciting to see this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, you can do pretty crazy things. So as, a, as an example of something pretty wacky, I think anyway, is um, you look at the phase of the moon, 
and um, you're an int or you're a string. Um, like a, as I was giving you the example of uh, foo.bar, here moody moody dot I'm sorry moody dot bar is, is going to be pretty moody. So um, I'm defining the macro moody. Its implementation is giving here, and it says well if um, one out of two return to program one, expand to the program one, and the other half expand to the program one, but it's spelled a little differently. Okay, so um, does that make sense? Good, because I have a question about this for you next. The extra quotes? Oh yeah, that's a good question. That's how it would work for the previous slide, I guess. The extra quotes aren't necessary. I can, uh, I'm pretty sure they're not. Um, let's try it. Yeah, so I defined it. Um, the triple quotes allow you to write anything inside those triple quotes, um, so you don't get escape, uh, the normal escaping behavior. Um, but we don't need them here, obviously, because there's nothing funny about one. Okay, so what this, what this macro will do when you call Moody, the compiler will call Moody Mita through reflection, Java reflection, actually. And it'll ask for a random float, look at it, and decide to expand into the AST one, the constant one, or the AST constant O and E, right? So depending on that, it'll have a different type because all the implementation is saying, I return a tree, which is a representation of a Scala program. And I've kind of left off um, the, the type here, which is bad Adrian, bad Adrian. You have to write this always, okay? This is actually super the next milestone. It, it, we won't let you anymore. Um, so. Um, just to be fair, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. I'll play by the same rules. So pop quiz. I mean, I've, I've given it away, right? Um, so who thinks this is going to evaluate to zero? No one. No. That's great. <coughs> With, okay, so what, what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly the right question. When is this invoked? Well, it's invoked when this expression is being type tagged, right? So what you're really writing is call the method minus on the expression moody. And that's what I've been harping on about. It's like, if you want to understand this program, you need to understand the type of moody. And in order to understand the type of moody, you need to run the implementation of the macro. In order to do that, you need to have a bytecode interpreter in your head. Or, you know, we can do some abstract interpretation or something like that. But, you know, the approximation is that this is not really going to work all the time. I just run it, and we'll see. Oh, look, it's zero. That's great. Let me try that again. Oh, shit. Not found value one. <laughs> Who saw that coming? So it's compile time? Or random? Or yeah. So it's not even a string. It's just a random bleep in the identifier. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, yeah. So that means these macros are not hygienic because it's trying to capture that. Well, um, yeah, the, the core macros aren't hygienic. There are mechanisms for hygiene, um, but I chose not to use them. Yeah, good point. Um, so quasi quotes normally, yeah? No, no, that also doesn't hold. So moody, moody equals equals moody um, will type check sometimes, you know, <laughs> statistically. <laughs> Uh, like you do the math, I'm not really good at intuitions about statistics, I know that much at least. Um, but yeah, about one and two or something, right? Uh, yeah, in the back. No, I know, it's one and four, but yeah. I know, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. At runtime of the compiler, yes. <laughs> No, so the Moody implementation is compiled to bytecode. It has to be, actually, for the compiler to consider it a macro implementation. But every time the type checker sees Moody, it'll reflectively invoke using the JVM, because we're, the Scala compiler is running on the JVM. It will use Java reflection to call that implementation of the macro. Every time. We don't do caching. That's why we're slow. No, you're not recompiling it. It's been compiled to bytecode, but we're constantly reflectively invoking it. So you're not actually, this is kind of tricking you into believing something that's not true. The REPL goes through all kinds of 
trouble to let you define macros in the same compilation unit as that you're using them. Actually, what the macro is doing is stacking up a bunch of objects uh, that let you pretend you're living in this ideal universe where you're really not. So it needs to be compiled first, and then it'll be reflectively invoked using the JVM's reflection capabilities. So the bytecode will be written for the string return as well as for the uh, integer return? Is that right? No. Uh, there will be bytecode for, so let me show you. Um, I can think I can show you. Well, I'd have to write a class. I'm too lazy. So um, if I were to run Java P on the other class that the REPL has generated for this method, it'll just, it'll just be regular Scala, right? The compiler doesn't know anything, doesn't need to know anything about this method, that it's a macro. It's just a method that operates on Scala ASTs. It doesn't do anything special. You're, everything you know about Scala compilation still holds. I'll, I'll come back to your question in a second. So this is just compiled to bytecode. This is also compiled to bytecode, but the compiler remembers that it's a macro, and it'll pickle, it'll remember in a class file annotation which implementation to reflectively invoke when type checking Moody. And since it's reflectively invoking, Moody Mita needs to have been compiled to bytecode, and it's compiled only once. It doesn't need to be anymore. But its invocation is actually compilation, right? You can think of that as compilation. It's like a mini compiler running and saying, the digit one identifier O-N-E, digit one, O-N-E, depending on phase in the moon. Yeah, sorry, your question in the back? Yeah, sorry. Well, so, so the macro is compiled to bytecode, right, once. And it's just a regular Java class with bytecode. The compiler is just a regular Java application, and it invokes the, method, the macro implementation, passing in on the stack a pointer to itself. So you're basically writing a compiler plugin. So we did our quiz. So as, a, as I kind of told you many times now, to even just autocomplete on a white box macro, not on a black box macro, the IDE must run it, must run the macro implementation. And actually, the Scala IDE for Eclipse does this because it's running a real Scala compiler. Um, so it, it, does, it does do that, and it sees the expanded code, which then confuses it a little bit. Um, so if you're writing a macro, um, you might want to try detecting the IDE and report your errors, but don't expand because it'll, it'll not create an ideal experience for someone using your macro. I'll have more on that later. So, oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> like I said, later. Um, so we're currently working on actually supporting IDEs in the macro API and giving you better tools for playing nice with both JetBrains and uh, offerings and, and our own. So let me tell you a little bit about a couple applications that are out there. This is just a very select few. Apologize if your macro isn't there, please yell out and I'll, I'll list it as well. Um, so as you've seen, there's a lot of code generation going on. You can generate your own range for each to be a while loop, which is great. You can do your own kind of specialization, uh, like little islands of specialization. So all those links are, are worth a read, I would say, if you have some time later. You can write fast parallel collections, Scala Blitz. You can scrap some boilerplate um, to do uh, JSON formatting or, or parsing, to do fast pickling. Quasi quotes are also just macros. Um, so in order to generate um, ASTs or, or pattern match on them, to give you like the line number functionality that you miss from C++. Um, and do all kinds of testing and tracing and asserting and lots of bells and whistles, really nice, useful stuff. Most of these are black box macros. You can do static checks, like spores that are closures that uh, make sure that they don't capture anything accidentally, which is great when you're writing a distributed application. Or you know you can be something more mundane and make sure that your printf uh, formatters are good. Um, you can write DSLs like SBT013 does. Um, async um, is a, a nicer way to work with futures. Um, also a macro. It's really just a compiler plugin that we package as a macro because it's less of a pain. Um, but it's a macro. Language virtualization, as you um, may have heard of in other talk, talks. And there's lots more links in these, behind these links. So when you're implementing macros, and after this I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll give you an example of one, use quasi-quotes. 
use quasi quotes. They're great. Be hygienic. Um, use fresh names. Um, and use fully qualified names starting at underscore root underscore. Otherwise, you might capture. Even Scala isn't as unique as you might think. So in the REPL, there's this great power mode that lets you uh, experiment with runtime reflection. There's a toolbox compiler you can also use to do unit testing of your macros. And avoid reset adders, which is something that undoes type checking, resets your whole program as if it had just been parsed, and then redoes type checking. Instead, combine type trees. This is very technical stuff, um, so um, I won't really go into it in this talk. So to give you a quick example uh, of runtime reflection, maybe I should check how I'm doing on time here. Oh, looks like I have some time to go into this. So there's, a whole, there's actually two universes of reflection. There's the universe, well, there's three really, but we don't want you to know about the third one, so I won't tell you. There's the two universes are the runtime reflection uh, and the macro reflection API. And the third one is the compiler. So um, here is an example of how you use the runtime uh, universe, which is great for, for invoking the compiler at runtime, really, and then and, and just having it do whatever. So the first couple examples just have a print line that conveniently has a number rather than a string. Um, and you know you can, you can show that tree to see what it looks like as, as a text representation. Or you can do a show raw, which you know, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, let me run it in the meantime. Like, and then the next thing is actually you run like a little mini compiler that is using Java reflection to load class files rather than reading them from disk. I'll scroll down in a second. Um, so you can do really neat stuff with that. Um, you're, you basically have your own little Scala, so you can write a REPL with that or do whatever. And so the toolbox has an eval method that is like, you know, the eval you might know from those languages who did macros first. So the one that you're seeing there, that's the result of the eval. So I evaluated the tree. Um, the ID is called identity because it'll just print whatever that, that program was. It has actually gone through a round trip between ASTs. And this shows you how you would actually construct that tree using the, the, the API that the compiler uses internally. So whenever you're writing print line, it's actually not just print line. There's a whole lot of stuff going on there. You're making a term name. You're making an identifier out of that. And you're applying that to a list of arguments. In this case, the literal constant one. And this is invaluable when you're, when you're not using or when you can't use quasi quotes for certain reasons. But most of the time, you can just use quasi quotes. So this brings me to my, my bigger example. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have wished in the past that they could just duplify that case class. Well, I have good news for you. You can. It's amazing. So uh, thanks to Dennis and, and Jason for, for helping me out with that. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of a macro noob myself, actually. Um, so the use case is, let's say you have a bunch of case classes. And you want to be able to kind of squash them down to their essence, which is really a product or a tuple. And so you want to be able to say, you know, person tuplify and you get a tuple that has all the case fields of your, of your case class. I'm sure at some point you've wanted to do this. You may not want to admit it, but you have. <laughs> so um, I'm going to introduce some helpers here to show you that macro implementations are just regular programs. You write them using regular Scala constructs. So we're experimenting here. So I'm importing language experimental macros. We're in the um, macro universe for reflection. And we're running a white box, white box macro, so that's pretty exciting. Um, I ask you to please forgive my, uh, my crimes against indentation. I couldn't fit it on a slide otherwise. Um, so we have a couple helpers here. Uh, the first is an extractor for term symbols. So a case field will match a symbol that represents a field of a case class. And it will tell you, if it is the case that it is a field, it will tell you its term name. I could also just point here, couldn't I? Um, it will tell you its name and its type. So the way it does that is, well, it looks at the term symbol, it says, are you a value and are you a case class, uh, are you a case accessor? If so, I'm going to do some really nasty stuff to your name. Um, you can ask me why, but I won't tell you otherwise. Um, and I will give you the name, it will give you the type of that symbol, 
right? So this is just your regular extractor definition. Look at the symbol, give you its name and its type, okay? And then the second thing would be your logic that says, hey, there's something wrong, here's an error message that will tell you what's wrong rather than some random vanilla Scala C error. So in this case, we're just gonna tell you, huh, it's not a case class. And it'll use the macro API. So whatever you see uh, selected on C is part of the, of the macro API. So in this case, you'll have your enclosing position um, and you can abort compilation. Not system exit, please. <laughs> We don't, we, don't, we don't keep you from doing that, but just it's not nice to your IDE user. Uh, although probably OSGI will actually not let you do that. I don't know, I haven't tried. Um, so any questions about like setting the scene here? This is just your arbitrary data processing happens to be Scala programs. Ah, totally not to ask. <laughs> Um, so um, the way that Scala is compiled, uh, we have multiple symbols for uh, uh, members of case classes for the, the, the fields. You got your private this field, you got your getter, you got your setter. And we do some sneaky name mangling on those so you can't call them from your Scala program. And the name mangling, we have to promise not to tell anybody, because otherwise people will start doing this, um, is the identifier is suffix with this white space. That's why I call, and there's no API method I looked, I swear, I looked for a long time. Um, there is one in the internal compiler uh, API, obviously. We don't do like trims all over the place while we're compiling your program, I promise. But there, we hadn't thought to expose that one in the official macro API. So um, you can either do as a lot of macro, I mean compiler plugins do, like async, to just cast the universe down to the compiler universe and then just go wild. Or you can just re-implement the functionalities as I've done here. So yeah, you just do a two string and a trim. What could possibly go wrong? And now I forgot whether I ran, I haven't run this yet. So let me run that. I went to great pains to make sure that I could like you know, actually run that stuff. All right, great. So now we get to the fun bit. So what we're gonna do is, uh, and I'll use this screen so you don't feel too discriminated against on this side, um, we're gonna, implement a, a, a case class actually. So we're kind of doing like a poor man's deriving from Haskell. So here's our case class and well, Google says it's a Google, but it's actually a trait. Um, as tuple, T view, and it's an isomorphism that only goes one way. If there's anyone who knows category theory, you can yell what that is, I don't know. Maybe it's an injection or something. Um, so, you know, it'll just say, I can tuplify your T's and it'll be a U after it's been tuplified. That's how I think about these things, to be honest. Okay, so we have materialize, who fits on a slide this way, um, which will give you an instance of this type class. Usually it'd be pretty tedious, um, because you have to write all those, right? You have to write it for every case class that you write, you'd have to do this, unless you're using Shapeless or something like that, who's done that before, like Miles has done all this nasty shit for you. I mean, stuff. Um, so, you know, here's the macro implementation. We're using macro bundles, which is nice for writing bigger macros as we're doing here. You know, as soon as it crosses a slide, you probably should consider macro bundles. And they're essentially like uh, methods, uh, except that they're, split, that they're a whole trait. So here I, I designate a method of a trait as my macro implementation, and the whole trait will be instantiated with uh, its C member being bound to the context, so you don't have to have the method dependent type in there, dependent method type, if you will. So uh, if I go, like, what this extends from helpers, and helpers extends from white box macros, and white box macros has a field context called C, because that fits on the slide, and you know, you write it all the time, even when you don't program in slides. So. This is your implementation here. We're gonna take a T that is passed in from here, that is passed in from there. And we actually wanna reify this, so we ask for a type tag. And since we're a macro implementation, we need to return a tree in the right universe, in the macro universe. So 
what we're going to do is actually reify this, so that just means make an object out of something. So we'll have this t object here that is representation of this t type argument there, t type parameter. And we're going to call our first helper method, or our second one actually, that we define to validate that t to check that it's actually a case class. Everybody with me so far? Okay. So what we're then going to do is look at that type, which is this object here, this weak type tag. Um, then, and we're going to ask for its declarations. So that will include you know, whatever methods in there, but also the case field, the case class fields. We're going to do a collect, just a collection, we can do whatever. And if it's a case field, so this invokes our extractor that we defined earlier. Excuse me. So if the declaration that we're collecting is actually a case field with name f and type tp, we will yield a pair, which will be the Scala program t.f, where f is spliced into this program. So it'll actually be t dot whatever name was for your, for your case class field, sorry, case class field, and tp whatever type you gave to your field when you declared your case class. Right? So this is just doing some data munging in your declaration, extracting the field accessors, giving you their names and their types. Unzip that, and what we're going to do now, and this is the important bit, is we'll need an instance of our type class here. Right? We're just, this is kind of the meta type class that knows how to generate this for all case classes. And so we generate an instance of this one, so it's like as tuple, that's our, that's our type class right there. The uh, type uh, parameter that we already reified, and this will splice in a list of things. So um, this is the, the tuple type constructor, you might not see it because uh, I kind of made it gray, but uh, these dot dot types thingies are in parentheses, so it'll make it into a tuple. So a tuple of cardinality n for n uh, types in the argument types here, because we made a list, right? Um, and then it'll implement the, the two tuple method. The two tuple method. I'll say, okay, well, I'm converting a t, and what I'm going to give you is n selections that I've generated here. So this t um, belong, uh, corresponds to the t and the argument here. Okay. So I see a lot of people want to ask questions. Yeah. It's a. Oh yeah. Um, that's an excellent question. Not an object, but a trait. Well, so as I, as I kind of hinted at, there's this abstract member C that is your context. And as part of the macro bundle translation, you will instantiate this class after mixing in that val C. Um, so it's an implementation detail of the macro bundles approach. So it's, it's, you're actually encoding um, de dependent method types using traits and value members rather than pushing the value member down into your argument list and then currying and using the, the uh, depending on the earlier argument there. So this kind of flattens or pulls out, if you will, the argument list into the member. Okay. More questions? Remarks? Oh, yeah. So in your... There's a lot of ways to break this. <laughs> um, which is why I told you not to use macros, remember? We're not, I can tell that's just the type safe side of things. Um, okay, well, and I, I don't mean the company. So if we run this, we'll have completed our macro implementation. Very exciting. So now I can show you Tuplify, which brings it all together. So I have our good old person who doesn't know he's going to be subjected to tuplification yet, but it's going to happen. So maybe I'll step over to this side, kind of balance it out. So case class, um, any questions about the case class? No, okay. Um, so we're gonna tuplify this thing um, and we'll require evidence that it is tuplifiable indeed. And this evidence will be supplied by our macro. And then when we get our hands on that evidence, we'll immediately use it to call the two tuple method. It's like, oh, you say you can tuplify? Well then tuplify. And we call that on the argument here. So this is just your ordinary implicit, it doesn't know anything about the macro. It doesn't care where its instances come from. It'll use them. Okay, so if I did everything right there, 
you'll get you know, a typed tuple that has its first element a string, second element an int, and the values of your person. All right. Ta-da! <laughs> yeah, I know. And that's amazing. So any questions about that? AOP. Um, actually, AOP is, we, we've done some, we've actually recently done some fun stuff with AOP. Um, I don't really know how to, like, do you mean in general macros or this example? This example, I, I haven't used aspect J in like a decade. Could you like I don't know? Do you have a sense of how you would do it? Well, you wouldn't. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Me neither, to be honest. I mean, there's definitely I mean, there's definitely use cases for for AOP that are similar to what you would do with a macro. I think as with anything that you're doing programming, there's something that AOP can do for you there, or mess up for you there. But yeah, it's it's kind of like that, except it doesn't really like. Get its, it doesn't really get to do runtime interception, right? It's all compile time. I think that's, that's, I mean, you could write aspect J with macros, I guess, but you'd have to in, inject the macro everywhere in your program explicitly. We don't have the cross-cutting, right? If I remember, it was, AOP was defined by doing cross-cutting and... Like the twice point, point cuts. Yes, point cuts, yes. Point cuts and advice. So you can do your advice, but I don't see how you would quantify over point cuts. And uh, the weaving is, I see how you would do that, but the, the cross-cutting would be much harder. I mean, besides, we have traits for that, if you want to do stuff like that, which is kind of like a hardness version of the AOP, I guess you could say. Yes? So two questions. One, can you chain macros? You say within the macro. Don't do that at home. <laughs> or do only do that at home. <laughs> In the kitchen. Uh, and the other is <laughs> or the, the source code when you want to when you debug through it. And sorry, I was I was so blown away by your first question and then here the yeah. second one. So yeah. what happens to the source code? Yeah. Now you're debugging through. Mm -hmm. the yep. Uh, well, you you want some source maps there, won't you? Um, well, I'll ask Eugene. <laughs> Maybe he'll implement <laughs> it. Um, you'd have to attach like some kind of class file annotation or something reified AST and. I'm sure they have been thinking about this, but um, that's not our priority right now. But yeah, I mean, you could do it. It would be painful. You'd have to get the IDs to support that. But it would be, I mean, I agree it would be very important to have. And actually, that reminds me, you know, right back to your question after that. Um, there's a cool IDE plugin that uh, a student, a Google Summer of Code student is working on called Sprinter. Um, it's, a, it's a fun acronym, I forgot. It's like something with Scala printing or something. Um, and it'll let you print the ASTs generated by macros and expand them inline into IDE. So you can, you get a refactoring basically to tell you, demacrify, and or you know just like you get an implicit expansion already in, in Scala IDE. Same thing for macros. Um, so that's so far I think the best I've seen. Um, but yes, I agree. Once you start using this in production, which is why we recommend you don't, you'll need something like that. Is there a roadmap for things that you really want to do with macros in the future? Besides get rid of them? <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. I actually, I'm very impressed by macros. I think they've made an amazing progress. Um, you're talking about features for macros? Well, I mean, is it just a cool tool, or is it something mm -hmm. that, you know, you have a whole list of things that you right. want to do with macros? TypeSafe isn't working on macros. Um, so it's all EPFL uh, that's doing the hard work. We're using them. Um, as a nicer way to write compiler plugins, like the Scala async stuff that we've done, is a really nice macro. You should have a look at it if you're interested in really advanced compiler plugin as macro thing. It does an ANF transform and then does a whole state machine translation. It's a lot of really cool computer science in there. Uh, and thank God we didn't have to write the macro machinery for it first because it'd be a failed at that for us. Um, I don't really foresee TypeSafe getting closely involved in macro development. But we, we are constantly working with EPFL to make sure that they, they're able to do their work, um, you know, get the pull requests through and so on. But most of the work that they're doing is actually done, ironically, as a compiler plugin. Uh, the Macro Paradise compiler plugin that is kind of the incubator for next, next generation macro APIs like macro annotations and type macros and untyped macros and all that crazy stuff. Um, you can use that in the 210 compiler and he's tracking 211 milestones as well. Um, as far as that ending up in a real release, next question? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it'll depend. If we can get it really stable, and I think our first priority is going to be black box macros, get those nice and solid, good API, 
documentation, tool support, and then we'll talk about the next level. Okay. Um, I think I'm almost done with my slides, actually. Um, I just quickly wanted to tell you something about 2.11. Um, that's actually what, that's my day job now. Um, so we slimmed down the library. We're working on speeding up the compiler. It's not, we can't do miracles, but it'll be faster. And we're slowing down the change, which kind of goes back to my previous question, because we want Scala to be stable and usable in production, not the crazy language that it used to be when I started working on it. Um, and you know, everybody wants this. EPFL is aligned with this vision and happy to work on their plugins. So we've pretty aggressively deprecated. I think this is the first Scala release where we've deprecated as much. I don't have statistics. Unfortunately, um, Modular is the standard library, so now you can roll your own Scala XML support if you want it. The compiler isn't married to the one that we have. Um, continuations are outside now. And that let us show, shave off about 20% megabyte off of Scala library jar size. So the main features to me of 2.11 are a better incremental compiler by Jagos Kosakowski, uh, optimizing the compiler itself, Jason, Jason Zauk, and on the EPFL side, uh, Miguel Garcia has, has been working on a better new uh, ASM B-code backend and optimizer. Um, that's all going to be experimental. So the NAST milestone is coming up next year. Um, please start testing your uh, projects. I think it's we're reasonably stable. A lot of uh, uptake already for a milestone anyway. A lot of artifacts out there already. An RC mid February. So um, time permitting, happy to take more questions now or later. Thank you. I guess we can do one more. Yeah, I just have one left. Right, because it's allowed to change the result type of the materializer. So you need to uh, generate different um, uh, as tuple, for example, person to pair string of int, or as tuple some other case class, and so on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is it also able to detect that within the quasi quotes? So um, going back to that second example. No, it's more. It's more like. Um, let me let me show you real quick. Um, so. My bearings. If this was a black box macro, um, well, actually, this runs a file of the type inference restriction. When calling materialize, in a, for, if it was a black box macro, we infer T and U fully before uh, expanding the macro. And what that would mean is T is equal to person and U becomes nothing because we don't know anything about it. To do the actual inference, we need to do the expansion and see the tuple that comes out here. And then we do type inference of that, compare that to you, and that's how you infer you. But in order to do that, you need to expand first. And we don't let black box do that. Excellent question. Thank you. I should have explained that. All right. All right. That's a great way to end the question. I'll be around. Thanks.